Good evening and welcome to another edition of The Probe here on the Joy News Channel. Well, the parliamentary system is a multifaceted institution, an intricate setup that defines the fundamental ethos of democratic governance. Some say it is merely a rubber stamp institution creatively established by the political elite to approve and push the whimsical dictates of the majority and the government of the day. Though we sit at this table tonight looking for answers, we get to probe this particular difficult matter. We probe this critical committee in Parliament to examine its role and relevance as well. I speak about the Select Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs. That's our focus on the probe tonight. My guest is the Chairman of Parliament's Constitutional and Legal Affairs Committee, Kwame Yume Duenchi. He's also the Asantia Chim North, um, you know, Asantia Chim uh, Central Constituency MP. We're live on the Joy News channel. We're on Joy 99.7 FM, myjoyonline.com. We're on DSTV channel 421, Go TV is 144. And every social media platform, we've got it covered. I am MFA Apau, and this is The Probe. We're right back, then we get talking. Please stay with me. You're welcome back. This is The Probe here on the Joy News Channel, and we're taking a look at Parliament Select Committee on Constitutional Legal Affairs, and the chairman himself is with us, Mr. Kwame Yumi Duimchi. Thank you very much for joining us via Zoom this evening. Um, I hope you're doing well. Let's text your microphone. Hello, good evening. You'd have good to evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Um, okay. Okay, great to have you uh, this evening here on the probe, uh, quite a while. But let's um, start off uh, by asking if uh, where you sit in parliament, a lot has happened. I saw you on the censure committee as well, as part of um, th that ad hoc committee that took a look at the censure motion uh, against the finance minister, Ken Ofoyata. We'll get into that plus the work of your committee, but how would you assess this particular meeting? Is the third meeting of the second session of the eighth parliament. How has it been so far, you'd say? Well, uh, uh, relatively, it's not been uh, as busy as the previous ones where lots of legislations were passed. But um, we should expect it's going to be busy from this week because the budget had been read and then the principles of the budget had been approved. The committees are meeting on the estimates of the budget. Normally what we do is to look at the performance of the year under review, and then uh, we look at the outlook. And this week is going to be very busy for almost all the committees. Mm. Uh, and then we would have to submit our reports. And then we'll be traveling towards the final stage of the approval of parliament, uh, of the budget. Okay. So it's going to be a very, very busy week. But like I said, legislations have not been very busy. We have quite a few before us as the committee, uh, Parliamentary Select Committee on Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs. And then so, so far so good. Well, you say it with so much ease that um, you're going to pass the appropriations amongst others as if everything is going to be smooth sailing. Is that what you're expecting considering everything that we've seen so far ahead of the budget reading, approval, Censure motion, amongst others. You're saying that you're expecting everything to be as smooth before you go on break? Well, uh, there may be some hitches. And uh, you mentioned the censorship motion. I termed it as much ado about nothing. And uh, so once you know where we are heading towards, one must be relaxed. And that's the way I, I saw it. Yesterday, I heard you talk about a lot of things, inclusive of the censorship motion with another colleague, member of parliament. And uh, he might be uh, disappointed, but uh, I, I think that uh, the way that it should have gone is what it went. Mm. Okay, but first off though, let me find out as we dig in, uh, were you part of the MPs that earlier called for the removal of Ken Ofoyata, by the way? I, I may not want to answer that question because um, I wouldn't want to say I am part or I am not part because at some point it was the decision of the majority caucus. 
and I am a member of the, I'm part of the majority caucus. So I cannot say that I wasn't part of it. But when it started, I had traveled out. Um, I, I, together with my ranking member, we traveled to Maputo in Mozambique. To, uh, we went for ACP EU meeting. And uh, so when I came, it was the heat was up, but I cannot say that I was in part because majority adopted the decision that the a few parliamentarians took. And then, uh, but uh, that uh, position is quite different from the grounds in the censorship and pushing. That's the point of departure. That's where we depart from each other. Okay. Well, even though you don't want to clearly state whether you were part or not, we've had some MPs, for instance, at least uh, the Science and Environment Minister, Dr. Ifriye, just this week mentioned that for him and some other members, they, they, they want to distance themselves from that. They're actually defending the finance minister. Would you want to join that splinter group or you would stay with the original you know, group and the calls that they made? Yeah, you give credit to the person that credited you. Uh, if I want to speak on the censorship motion, I am with the finance minister 100%. I say this because when he was, uh, there were seven accusations that the minority gave. The committee said that two of them he should not answer, but the five of them he answered. And when he had answered, I would have thought that the committee would have come to a consensus to say that, look, the finance minister had already done that. So there's no need pursuing this censorship motion. Mm -hmm. But the, I think they were still pursuing and pushing for that. And I didn't see uh, really any point in there. And okay. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I think they should have withdrawn the motion. Mm. That's my, my, my view. Okay. But the other things that the majority has said that the finance minister must be removed or speaking to the president that there should be a change um, of ministers. I do not think that they are accusing the finance minister of doing anything, but I think the main reason is to build confidence in governance and then Ghanaians would have some hope. That's all that the majority was saying about the finance minister, that the change of face would bring some confidence into the system. Not that he has stolen some money, not that he had actually gone to open an account offshore and push, uh, push in Ghanaian uh, cities and whatnot. So that's mm. where we depart from each other. Well, the, the change of face did not happen. Would you say that people still have confidence in the government? Yes, I, I think people have confidence, but I think if the reshuffle had come, their confidence would be increased or it will be built up, up and up. <laughs> mm. It's not there, but it would be it's not increased, really, say. It's not over. It's not over. Um, the, he had read the budget and uh, we are dealing with that. We have the books we will be discussing with him. Uh, some people think that he is very good and he is a person that can actually take us out of our troubles. Okay. Others think that if he is removed, that will build some confidence in the, in the system. And um, well, I know the, 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 where the the problems within the country where um, the, the city had fallen and whatnot. And the, the obvious reasons and what you have given, it, uh, you know, what you have heard is the, the war between Russia and Ukraine and also the COVID. So really we have problems at our hand. Mm -hmm. Now we have gone to IMF. One of the reasons why people think that the finance minister uh, should have actually uh, withdrawn is that he himself told Ghanaians that he would not go to IMF, but it got to a time that he went to, an, to IMF. So at that point, people thought that he would resign. But the allegations that, that they are giving uh, against him and uh, that he's done this, he's done that, um, is neither here nor, nor, nor there because he was given an opportunity. He sat before the whole 
of the nation and uh, gave his explanations. And I think it was convincing enough. So far as I am concerned, it was very convincing. Okay. And so as a, member, uh, as a member of the committee, your view is that the finance minister convinced you. Well, but this is an issue that we'll delve deeper into. Let's hold it right there on that. But the, okay. widely, held, the widely held view is that as a majority, you did something which was unprecedented. A lot of people hailed you for that, only for you to go to a meeting. We are told you met a businessman, you met the president. Then along the line, something changed. All of a sudden, the position has changed and um, you don't want his removal. You don't want the processes that the minority is going through amongst others. Let me find out. As a majority, are you taking your constituents seriously? Well, first of all, Emifa, you are building an argument and uh, the, um, the premises of the uh, argument or the discussion, I would say, is false. If it is false, which then part the is false? Which part that is will false? be drawn. Which part is the, false, Mr. Yeah, Nimei Doenchi? Which part? The part, that, the part that there had been meetings and when we went for the meetings and thereafter we have changed our position, that is not correct. So correct me then, what happened? So we cannot, you, did did, so you, we did cannot your team build, not meet the president? No, what had, what had happened was that, what had happened was that we had actually come up. Mm -hmm. The majority has said that there should be a change of face. And because we want to build some confidence in governance. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we had not gotten that. Before we could finish with what we were pursuing, the NTC came up and says that let's censor the minister because the minister had done A, B, C, D, and then uh, A, B, C, D, E, F. So we said that, no, what the minister had done, let's set up a committee and go through it because the minister needs to defend himself. So I made committee was set. Then I was privileged to be part of the committee. Then the minister came and then answered every allocation that had been put that, before that's, you, you are right on that, but you are, you are disputing yes. the fact that certain meetings happened when your call came, which was unprecedented, that a lot of people praised you for. So which part is false, that you met the president or you met the businessman? Which part are you disclaiming? I'm not aware that we've met any, any businessman and I'm not aware that uh, we've met a president. Okay. I am not aware of that. You were not part of that meeting, you'd say? I, 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 apart from not being part of that, I am not aware that the president had met us on this. You have never heard that the president met you and said that you never. should allow the finance never. minister. That's the why I said that the, the basis of your argument was false. Okay. And once it is false, we will not come true. Was there a meeting at the, was there, maybe you may not meet, you may now have met the president himself, but was there a meeting at the Jubilee House that you were in attendance or you are not aware of any meeting uh, after your I call? Haven't. After your call, there was attended. no meeting. I haven't attended any such meeting. Or you have not attended, but you... I know. haven't attended, and I'm not aware that a meeting has been held with some members of parliament present. Okay, so you have not been compromised in any way, you would say. When people accuse not, you, no, when no. people accuse the majority members that you are just a big joke, nobody should take you seriously. You're actually yeah, not taking your I constituents seriously. The conclusion would be an invalid conclusion in philosophy. Mm. Once you are, you are drawing a conclusion from a, a premise that is not true, then uh, the conclusion would always be invalid, not true. Okay. So it is not the base, the, the, the formation, how uh, uh, the, the premise that you start from, the argument from, is not correct. And okay. I, that's why I wanted to correct but you. But it's interesting that now you that say after your call, it's interesting that you say that after your call, you are not aware of any such meeting. But let me find out, will your team, at least you, you, you agree with the call initially because you say a change of face will build confidence, as you've said, that did not happen. At least from what the leadership tells us is that they were told to allow him to present the budget and also after the IMF, uh, you know, staff level agreements and everything, then he can, we can take a decision on whether he steps aside or not. Are, them, are you prepared to see through this particular demand that you've made or you've abandoned it? And that's what we are doing. So we are, we are so like he started a budget. He's presented a budget. And you realize that discussing the budget, he's there to answer 
questions on the budget. And then uh, he would have to see us through the appropriation. And I know he's also started the IMF negotiations. And I think the, the status quo ante should be maintained. And uh, no, uh, it's not over yet. And that's how I see it. Yes. So it's part of the process. You have not abandoned your call for the removal of Keno Foriata? I don't think so. You don't think so? No. But we have abandoned the call for censorship because he answered everything. And then uh, I think that the minority should have withdrawn their motion, which they didn't. And I will tell you this time why I think they should have withdrawn you, the You motion. can tell us that because we'll get into it right now. Let's talk about the censure because you have actually endorsed everything that the finance minister did when he appeared before your committee. You've right. mentioned how satisfied okay. you are. So uh, why do you say as much ado about nothing? Right. Um, uh, there were seven charges against him. Uh, the first and second, we never asked him to answer. Because the first one, the committee came to a conclusion on legal grounds that it was, they, they alleged that it was a conflict of interest. And then uh, the conclusion was that uh, with conflict of interest, the right form was the charge. We didn't go in there. The second one was that he had actually opened an offshore account mm -hmm. and had siphoned money into that. Now, we had uh, somebody from PIAC coming to testify that this money had gone. It was only when we called GMPC that GMPC came in and said that, look, we had actually, prior to this, there was an agreement between the, a foreign company and Ghana, and they were part of lift, taking the liftings of our oils and whatnot. So GMPC went in to purchase that interest when the, the, the company didn't want to proceed and, and took a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do with the finance minister. So he did okay. not do it. Mm -hmm. The other things that, for instance, Honorable Atuforsen talks about is that uh, he should have been censored for a long time because the fiscal responsibility was on him. Was, uh, he had breached the fiscal responsibility act because a, a section of the law says that if we could have a deficit of more than five percentage points plus one, then uh, we have to censor the minister. This law was brought by the minister himself. The bill was brought by the minister to the finance committee we deliberated upon it, and then we sent it to the plenary. And then uh, we accepted the bill into an act, mm -hmm. and we completed this act December 2018, when we had the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Honorable Art of Forcing uses his own methods by saying that he should have, you know, on the budget, we have the underline, below the line and above the line. And he says that, there were some items that should have gone above the line. Mm -hmm. Because he did not do that. Which had been the practice he, over the period. You agree? Yes, mm -hmm. but which practice the finance minister answered that the IMF, we were under the bond at the time. Okay. Under the, the, the fund at the time. And the IMF approved of that. And he cited instances where IMF had agreed that the method we had used was the best. The important thing was that the Fiscal Responsibility Act was passed in December 2018. Then you refer to 2018 budget and 2019 budget. The Fiscal Responsibility Act was not applicable okay. because the 2018 budget was read in November 2017. And this law was passed in December 2018. Well, but these are By details that you've been through, at least. Uh, we've me, all Jennifer. seen, we've all excuse gone through me. this process. So in fast forwarding, your, fast forwarding, really, fast forwarding, your then you brought your report. You've told us where you stand on this. So let I understand me, me as I saw you throughout the committee, you were on the side of the finance minister, even though you were supposed to be on a fact-finding mission. Now I know. Truth. So let's fast forward. Truth. Let, no, truth, uh -huh. truth be told. Mm -hmm. 
that I didn't finish the point. I said that the 2018 budget was read in 2017. And the 2019 budget was read November 2018. So if you are talking about 2019 and 2018 that he had actually exceeded the amount that he should not exceed and had created a higher deficit, then the law was not applicable. In 2020, because of COVID, the minister came out, pointed the exceptions, and says that we were not in normal times, and therefore he wanted to suspend the session. And parliament agreed, and it was suspended. So there was no issue. Okay. There was no issue to be answered. It, then it, the other things, like the other things, I'll say that they are politics. That is because of him that we are having problems. Is it because of finance minister that the whole world is having problems? We mm -hmm. agree that everywhere in the world, there are problems. Well, you are the ones that called for his removal first. At least you were the ones that yes. held the press conference yes. for that to happen. So if anybody follows you, it's surprising that we'll see this flip-flopping on your part. There are some who say that from this flip-flopping that we've seen, at least you saw you walk out of parliament when it mattered the most. Some have said um, it will cost some of you your seats. Do you agree? No, I don't. Because we need to be objective. Being a member of parliament, you have a conscience on your own. Your people have sent you there. And you have to do the right thing. We call the minister to come and answer issues that he had actually siphoned. Let me tell you, MFA, before I went on the committee, I had an open minded. Okay. When the NDD spoke, I was not sure. Is it true that the man had actually siphoned money and uh, offshore account and he was putting money that belonged to Ghanaians into that? Then mm. we realized that, fortunately, by our rules, we we're not supposed to sit alone. All of us. We, it, it, not in camera. So he came and then uh, he answered every, every question that was put to him. There was nothing left. Okay. And then you still insist that he should be censored. I cannot be part of it. And that's why we walked out. Okay. So by yourselves, when you were calling for the removal, it was just for confidence building and not because he had done anything wrong. No, not because he had stolen money. No. But no. you just so wanted him when to... when we are talking about our affism, when we are talking about our house matters, uh -huh. then you jump into conclusion that, okay, let's go and accuse him that he had actually stolen. So and your removal, your removal you are describing that call for the finance minister of Ghana's removal as your house matters, your MPP house matters. That's how you describe it. Yeah, because we are advising the president that... Even if he does the reshuffle and is, for instance, sent to uh, another ministry, mm -hmm. like energy, like education, like whatever, we are comfortable. Mm. So this one, you did not even think that your constituents were interested in it. The entire country, you don't think that you were speaking for all of us, but you were just playing with us, would you say? No, we are not playing. Fortunately, the NDC also, under the mistaken impression comes out and says that a b c d he has done that okay and the man comes before the whole country and says that well you said this this is the answer you said this this is the answer the money for the cathedral was the issue okay then he said that well this one i use it from the contingency vote and the contingency vote is allowed as part of the budget i had said this all along okay and i brought the budget to parliament Everybody. And he cited, for instance, in 2014, when we went to Brazil for football, the same thing the NDC government did. They got the money. That was the money. They took a plane and went to Brazil with it. And then there was a whole hula bala about it. Then he even said that currently, we even needed to get some money to go to Qatar. And that was where the provision was made. So clearly, saying that this was unlawful, or it was unconstitutional. The man explained, and I think his explanation okay. was convincing. Well, let's talk about your committee in particular, at least when this third meeting of the second session of this eighth parliament was about to take off. Uh, we're all hopeful 
that one thing at least was going to happen, which is uh, this particular work on, on the promotion. Hold on, hold on. Yes. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. what you are, where you are going. Well, my, let let me finish. Maybe if I finish, you know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I finish, you may know where I'm going. So I'm talking about the promotion yeah, I, I of really Proper Human going. Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill 2020. I call it the LGBTQ Bill. Ah, that's how you call it. Okay, that's the yeah. full name for it. Some have also called it Anti-Gay Bill, amongst others. We're hoping that some significant work would have been done on this so that we all know our, our way clear, so to speak. What really is the state of that bill? Well, let me tell Ghanaians that Emefa had chased me on this bill to uh, find the outcome of this bill. And uh, I, um, together with my ranking, we said that we're not going to grant any uh, public interview on this. But I'll answer you uh, here. We had actually done a lot on this bill. And um, what is left now is probably one sitting, and then our report will be ready. Now, I also sounded a caution that when this bill came, when it was coming before Parliament, people uh, had, had a belief that this bill was actually going to be passed the next three days, the next one week, or what. Parliament doesn't work like that. Now, my, the truth of it is that now even committee meetings, we have actually exhausted our quota as the committee. And I'm having difficulties because all the meetings that we held, the public meetings, inviting the public, televisions and whatnot, we used our committee money in conducting those public hearings. So we are financially handicapped. But the Attorney General had also given, given us an advice on the bill. Uh, last week, we met. But because Attorney, we waited for some time, then the Attorney General had a series of meetings. So he explained and he needed to leave. But because of this budget hearing, for instance, tomorrow at 9 or 10, we have a meeting from morning till evening. We are looking for a window of an opportunity to invite the Attorney General, and then he will take us through the advice that he had given Parliament. Remember that he is the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. So we cannot take his advice for granted. And then when we are done with that, then uh, we can actually submit our report to the plenary. And I'm hopeful that we can submit the report before we rise for Christmas. So within now and um, the 24th or 25th, before you rise, we're hoping that we'll see some, yes. we'll see this building yes. at the plenary. It will be late. Yes, I'm, I'm positive. Okay, but there, there have been accusations that you in particular, as, as the chairman of this committee, is one of the main reasons why this bill has not seen much progress as it ought to have been seen. How do you respond to that? That is just not correct. That is false. It's false? It is false. Palpably false, MFA. But now you're there telling... Are, mm -hmm. the, the committee members are 18. Mm -hmm. There are 18. There is a chairman and then there's a ranking. On the NDC side, the person that leads the NDC side is the ranking member. And I am the, I leave the MPP side, I'm the chairman. There cannot be a meeting until we both agree, and then we whip our members, then we sit and deliberate on that. We have gone far, we have actually managed, we have sat at Koforidia, we have sat at Parliament, we have actually deliberated on the, 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 the bill. As my ranking member always says, the bill would never come out the same way it was brought to us. And we have actually done a lot to that. Well, so, what kind of changes? What kind of changes have we made? Because you are just at the last step. You say, uh, you know, we know it will not be brought back the same way as it came to you. Uh, what kind of transformation has it gone through as we speak? Well, I I will not, I will not be able to share that with you now, because when the report is ready, we will go through it. My ranking member will go through. Other committee members will go through. Then we we'll submit the report to the plenary. So on my own, maybe. Even the, what I may think that we have agreed on, we can do reconsideration 
of that. So it, it, it is not expedient to actually say that we have done that, we have done that, we have done that. But when the report is ready, we will tell Ghanaians. Well, we are in an era of haircuts, so it appears that this bill has also <laughs> seen some haircut. What, what form of haircut would you say, um, you know, low cut like mine, or which kind you would say? Well, I, I, I just admire the low kind that the one that you have, you have is very nice and it fits your face. You okay. see, I've also done the same thing. Okay. Any side, we side that on the finances, I, re I restrain myself. But, to but on a more serious note, though, would you say that it's, it's seen a lot of, you know, changes or work done to it such that by the time it comes out, we will not recognize this uh, particular bill as we brought it to you? Oh, no, I wouldn't say that you will not recognize it, but I said that it will not come out the same way that it came. For instance, uh, well, MFA is pushing me to say what I don't want to say. Okay. Uh, for instance, I remember somewhere there was uh, a sentence of punishment to be 10 years or something. The committee said that this was too high. And uh, I think we came to a compromise, if I am right, it's probably three years or five years. Okay. So, like I said, we are not, uh, and there are some things that I was already in the criminal code, for instance, um, that is, um, um, so, um, the criminal code is against, uh, let me put it this way for, uh, the public to understand uh, Sudan mm -hmm. uh, is not right and the criminal code already caters for it. So how do we uh, look at this proper family sexual uh, uh, values or bail and the, even the name itself. I remember that we want to uh, a certain uh, embassy to actually uh, we're having some discussions if we can study their law okay. and uh, they were not ready to entertain us because the name itself, uh, they were not comfortable. And I think the Which embassy name, is that? Which embassy is that? No, Eva, uh, sorry, I, I said that I don't want to mention the, okay. the embassy's name because uh, I'm, in the, uh, I'm the chairman of it. And I, I, I think that one is a privileged information. Okay. I wouldn't mention that. Well, uh, that was the person's view. It might not be the country's view. Okay. It might be because... Uh, we were trying to, and there are other countries that we had actually uh, studied. So speaking uh, about embassies, yeah, speaking about embassies, um, at this point, it's okay if uh, we hear from uh, others on this as well. Mr. Nimeduenchi, we are grateful so much that you are with us. But let's take, this is an audience-driven show, so we'll have to take some questions as well uh, from the public. But I know that um, uh, Mr. Sam George, at least, is the main uh, proponent, one of the main proponents of this particular bill. So we want to hear right. from him now that you've given us information that, indeed, um, some work has been done and we're hoping to lay it before you rise amongst others. The Speaker, for instance, had mentioned that we're hoping that we'll pass this before the 2024 election. I, I'll take your view on this. Mr. Sam George, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on the probe tonight. So you've heard the chairman of uh, the committee on this. There's something also that I want to pick your thoughts on. We've been hearing from the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, on this particular issue. He's been speaking on foreign affairs with my colleague, um, Blessed Suga. So stay with me, Mr. Sam George. I also have Edem Senanu briefly. We'll take your comments on this and then uh, we'll wrap up with Mr. Enyeme doing interest. Let's listen to Virginia Palmer, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana. Discrimination is harmful, and it's harmful not just to the people who are discriminated against. It's harmful to everybody. I was talking about the cultural inhibition. So am I. Um, there were cultural inhibitions. I mean, the, the South African government, um, the apartheid government said, oh, God intended that the white man, you know, be separate. That's what apartheid was. Um, and I think, I think God was invented for, you know, or invoked for a lot of colonial repression. So, um, Again, we're not, we're not commenting on the morality of this. We're just asking for um, people's rights to be respected, that they be left peaceful and free from harm. What we have happening is that Ghana is tightening its laws that may, in terms of the implication, affect persons who have LGBTQ orientation. Mm. Uh, our Speaker of Parliament is assuring that uh, the mm. proper sexual rights and family values bill mm will be passed before 2024. It has implications for
the LGBT community? I think it's a political hot potato, and I think in some ways it's being used as a political hot potato. Um, and what I'm saying is that I hope that Ghana, Ghana's citizens and Ghana's parliamentarians, Ghana's leaders will respect Ghana's constitution and its international obligations to which it's a signatory. But our laws do not permit, for instance, activities of LGBTQ persons. I think, I think a lot of people haven't read the bill as, as currently before committee. Um, and I, I think people should read the bill and be aware that it threatens, for example, radio journalists that would air a story about LGBT persons. Now, is that an encroachment on freedom of speech? Um, I, 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 I think we need to be careful that, that the space of Ghanaians isn't, isn't limited. Since you're passionate about this, Madam Ambassador, I'm interested in knowing what diplomatic measures you may take in dealing with this matter. Um, in February last year, President Biden issued a memo in relation to protecting LGBT rights, and portions indicate that, quote, agencies engaged abroad shall consider appropriate responses, including the use of full-range diplomatic and assistance tools, and as appropriate, financial sanctions and visa restrictions and other actions. Has Ghana crossed the line, and are we likely to face some of these sanctions? Yeah, you're pushing me hard on this. I've answered four times um, that, that we're not looking for special rights for LGBT people in, in Ghana. We're asking that their rights be respected under the Constitution and international human rights conventions to which Ghana is a signatory. Um, so I don't want to get hypothetical about other tools that are available. But I, I do also want to note that like I'm doing it. Um, I'm answering your questions in good faith. And I'm also trying to be as humble as possible because I am a foreigner. And this is a Ghanaian cultural debate. It's also a constitutional debate. Um, and it's one that, it's a conversation that Ghanaians must have. Um, have we crossed the line, Madam Ambassador? Again, I'm, I'm not going to get <laughs> hypothetical. Well, so and that's uh, Virginia Palmer there, is the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Ghana. They're interacting with my colleague, Blazek. So, guys, the Foreign Affairs, that full interview is on all our social media platforms that we can catch. But uh, quickly, let me uh, take the thoughts of uh, Mr. Sam George, and then I'll bring in Adam Senanu. Then I'll come to you, Mr. Kwame Yimidwentri. Mr. Um, Sam George, thank you once again uh, for joining us here on the probe. So, you've heard the, the chairman of the committee, and then also the U.S. Ambassador. At least there's some progress, um, the chairman tells us. At least by before you rise, you would see that bill laid. But I don't know if you've heard about some of the changes that has it's gone through. Are you satisfied with work done? Well, good evening to your viewers and uh, to my co-panelists. Um, we've done a lot of work in the course of this year, and let me use this opportunity to extend uh, my gratitude on behalf of myself and my seven colleagues to the members and the leadership of the Constitutional Parliamentary and Legal Affairs Committee, led by Honorable Kwame Ayimedu and Honorable Bernard Ahiafo as ranking member and chairman, and say that we're grateful for the work we've done together. Like he rightly pointed out, um, there's no bill that comes to parliament that goes through and comes out the way it went in. We've seen some changes. Um, most of these changes have been reached by consensus, um, largely by conversation, by us as sponsors coming back to the committee after they've raised these issues in the several meetings that we've had, we've had close to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, almost 10 sittings on this particular bill with the committee. Um, I know that the committee chairman is complaining that this bill has maxed out his committee budget and all, but it's for the good of the country. We, we've done a lot of work. Um, <laughs> we've done a lot of work on the, on, on the bill and there, there, there are few changes that have happened. And these are changes that we believe are not inimical to the spirit and letter of the of the bill. For example, and, and I listened to Honorable Aimee made, made the point about the duration of punishment, for example, for broadcasting or aiding or abetting or promoting LGBTQ, which was proposed for a term of five years and maximum 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, we decided to make that a second degree felony. And for consistency purposes, you have to look at the Criminal Offenses Act and look at what the punishment for for, for second-degree felonies are and then make sure that it's consistent so you then see it become a three to five year instead of a five to ten years. So those are some of the issues that um, have been dealt with. 
there have been one or two other issues that have been discussed. For example, and, and I, I, I think I might be better to share this, the issue of intersex, for example. If you read the original bill, we, we, we recognize intersex as a biological anomaly and, and even make the point that we are not criminalizing it. So if you read the original bill and you read uh, plus six of the original bill, or section six of the original bill, because it's not yet law, um, and, 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 and you see the, the offenses that are listed, intersex is not one of them. But then the committee raised the point, I know the chairman did that very forcefully, that if we're not criminalizing intersex persons, then why did we even find it have expression in there? Mm -hmm. We had a back and forth on that conversation and said, look, we're making the point clear so that tomorrow nobody goes to arrest an intersex person and say they want to prosecute them under this law, okay. only to go to court and find out that they are not criminalized by the law. But then the decision later was reached by consensus that, well, if you're not criminalizing it, you can take it out of the bill. So those are some of the things that have been looked at. But generally, the letter and spirit of the law, which is to clamp down on the promotion and activities and sponsorship and advocacy of LGBTQ rights in Ghana still remain intact in the bill. And, and like you said, um, I, I, we're hoping to have this one meeting with the Attorney General. The Attorney General has done his, his memo, his, his opinion. It's a public document. If you read that public document, about 75% or 80% of that document agrees with the bill anyway. Mm -hmm. There's about some 20% where there's disagreements. And even with the 20% that there are disagreements, the Attorney General was disagreeing with the original version of the bill not the updated version of the bill that we have done work on with the committee. And so when you take that 20%, about 80% of that 20% has already been dealt with okay. by the, with the committee. So there's okay. just a little issue of um, the issue of fund costs yeah. to the state okay. that, that is outstanding. And, and for that, we hold a different and contrary view to the Attorney General. The committee is at liberty to take a decision on the Attorney General's memo and put it in the report. But let's bear in mind that anything that a committee even expunges from the bill, whether it is by consensus with the sponsors or not, any member of parliament on the floor of the house is at liberty to reintroduce a bill or act for deletion of a bill. So a lot of that work will happen when the debates start. But okay. I'm excited to hear from the chairman, and I, and I take his word for it, that we could lay that report uh, before the house rises on the 21st or 22nd. Okay. And, and before I let you off, you've been hearing from a U.S. ambassador um, to Ghana, Virginia Palmer on this, uh, tasking parliamentarians and leaders as you go through this, at least, whilst you respect your constitution, also respect your international obligations. Are you going to incorporate this whilst we go through the entire process? Well, I listened to the portions of the interview you've played by the US ambassador. I'll make just two quick points. First and foremost, the US ambassador should be my guest, and, and I'm sure that Honorable Aivedu would also be willing to oblige her on a lecture of the Ghanaian constitution. She should read Article 39 of the constitution, the cultural imperatives under the directive principles of state policy, and see what it says about integrating the state's role in integrating the appropriate customary and, and societal values and uh, customary values in our society. So this bill is directly, is 100% in continent with our constitution. She will need to get better education on our constitution. Again, when it comes to the issues of international treaties, I, I'm yet to hear her speak of which specific international treaty Ghana has signed up to that gives rights to LGBTQ persons. There is no such bill. When you take the international, the UN Declaration on Human Rights, the International Covenant on, on Persons, uh, be it civil and economic rights, the African Charter on, 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 on people and, 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 and society, it is all clear in there. There are no LGBTQ rights. And then lastly, let me just make the point. Mm -hmm. She says she's not speak she's speaking about rights and rights not being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. We'll take a lecture from the American ambassador when her government decides not to discriminate against people who have a right to polygamy in the United States. When the US is able to respect the rights of persons to have more than one wife legally, which is allowed in Ghana, when they respect the rights of persons to marry multiple women or marry multiple men as they so choose, which is also a fundamental human rights to association. If the US government is able to respect that right, then we'll have a conversation. But until they're able to respect the rights of, of persons in the US who want to be polygamous, they don't have any moral rights to come and talk to us about rights. Again, when the US is ready to sign up to the International Criminal Court, and put the American president under subjection of that international criminal court for the criminal records of the United States government across the world, then we'll take a lecture from them. But for now, the U.S. government is the last government 
that should speak about human rights. They are the biggest abusers of human rights. And so we would give them a lecture on how to respect the human rights and fundamental human rights of people, okay. not the other way around. Mr. Sam George, thank you so much uh, for joining us. That's Ningo Prem Prem MP, one of the proponents mm -hmm. of the promotion of proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian families bill. We are grateful. Let me quickly bring in uh, Mr. Adem Sinanu also. Uh, they were ones who also made a case, a strong case, uh, for this bill, and it's made some progress. We're hearing for the first time that before Parliament rises, this particular meeting, third meeting of the second session of the eighth Parliament, it will be laid. Um, that makes you happy, doesn't it? Well, absolutely it does. Uh, we've tried to keep track of what is going on in Parliament. Uh, we are aware when we went to Fredua. We've been aware in the subsequent discussions. Uh, we are also happy to note that uh, Parliament has taken certain decisions that allow all the outstanding issues, I mean, to a large extent, to have been dealt with. So we are happy with the work, and I think that, like uh, Sam did, uh, we need to commend the leadership of the Constitutional Legal Affairs uh, Committee for the work done so far. We are looking forward to the final product, uh, and hopefully the outstanding issues will all be dealt with. Okay, but as um, we lay it before uh, Parliament rises, that's before Christmas, you have a caution though, or um, some hopes that um, you're looking forward to. When exactly do, are you looking at a timeline that um, it ought to be passed finally amongst others? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, considering the amount of work that has been done and the good faith that has been shown all around, mm -hmm. um, we are, we, are, we are just happy to note that there has been substantive progress. Um, what will be happening before the rise, we cannot tell. I, I think Parliament is a master of its own processes. Um, and, and then what will happen in the subsequent uh, period, we are very hopeful that given the amount of work that has gone in, it is very likely that as we enter 2023, we'll be hearing some good news on this bill. But as it is, uh, considering the feedback we've had on the work that has been done and the compromises, to a very large extent, the spirit of what we sought to achieve has been, I mean, retained. And for that matter, I think that uh, all of us, at least at this stage, are happy to note the work done and the results that they have uh, managed to put out. Um, hopefully, when they are in a position to share that to the public, all of us will also be able to comment much more forcefully on the issues. Okay. Ms. Adam Sedano, thank you so much for your input. And I'm sure in the coming days, I uh, would expand the conversation and have more once uh, it's laid. Thank you uh, so much once again. Uh, we still have the chairman of the committee, the Asante Achim Central MP, Kwame Inyue uh, with us uh, in uh, via Zoom, I was just going to say, in the studios. We've been taking a look at a wide range of issues, and this one um, is topical at this point. Well, you've been hearing from the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer. They are concerned about whilst respecting our constitution also, we should also be taking a look at our international obligations, respecting rights of um, persons who say they are LGBTQ amongst others. Well, let's talk about pressures, external pressures whilst doing this work. You've been talking about an embassy that you didn't want to mention. I'm just giving you one embassy, for instance, raising concerns whilst we go through this. During this entire work, before you comment on exactly what she said, what kind of pressures have you been through, Yute? Absolutely none. None? No pressures whatsoever. No pressures. Mm -hmm. We have rather sought to learn the best practice. For instance, we've actually learned from France and we actually went there to Parliament. We also went to Hungary to actually understudy them. If we had the resources, we should have gone to Canada. We advanced our plans to go to Canada, but we couldn't. A country like South Africa, where they had actually practiced um, um, apartheid, and then they actually passed a law in favor of LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. One would wonder where this, we transi this transitioned from one extreme to the other, but we don't have the opportunity to actually go there. Uh, we have actually had uh, Zoom meetings with some people from Zimbabwe and South Africa, and we, we at least we have an idea 
where they are coming from. But if I have to comment on the, what the U.S. ambassador said, she, she was very careful in the choice of her words. She never said anything against the country. She rather cautioned that we should actually look at our constitution and our international laws. And so that's, we are on the same wavelength. That's why I had actually said that it is important for us to actually meet the Attorney General because he had actually given an opinion and he has to speak to us on that. And when we are done with that, we'll submit our report to the plenary. We rather are trying to go to countries, a country like Uganda, we heard that they passed the law, but our research shows that when they passed the law, they actually nullified the law because they didn't have the courtroom to pass it. A country like Hungary, as I said, the whole of Europe said that they are actually looking at it from the uh, children's, uh, if you look at the human rights, they say that the children's rights, that there are some other things like books and whatnot, you can't introduce them in class. And Hungary, when they had a problem, they had to amend their constitution in order to make sure that some principles they wanted to put in place were in place. We learned okay. from them. Mm -hmm. Some few members of us went there. We have not had an opportunity to learn from the United States. Canada was ready to actually give us an opportunity to meet people and discuss with them. But I said, like I said, we have not had an opportunity to actually learn from Canada, even though we've had some discussions with uh, other members from that region. So, uh, you see, the U.S. ambassador said that she was careful not to actually descend on that. Yeah. But on the whole, I would say that most African countries, if not all, are saying, apart from South Africa that had passed the law in favor of the LGBTQ people, most African countries, the general perception is that, look, we hate this. This is a taboo. And then other places, in Europe, in America, and they say that, look, these are individual rights. Whether it's a human right or not, is what uh, we have to look at. Because there are other things in the Constitution. But now we say that, is it a sexual orientation or it is a, a right? For instance, to determine whether... At least it's someone... been extensively described as a right. For which reason people right. are asking for its protection. So, so that's why you have to allow the committee, give us the opportunity to actually go through this and then we come out of consensus. As my colleague already said, when we are finished with our report, we submit it to the plenary and then I'll be leading the, the consideration stage in Parliament. But I do not decide. The whole of the House would have to decide on this bill. Okay. So when we are done with the report, we submit to the plenary. Then when we do the second reading, then we go to the consideration stage. And then we may add or deduct based upon the report that we we'll submit to the plenary. So it's a whole process. And yeah. when we are done, then we have to send it to the president uh, for assent. So. Um, I think earlier on I said that Ghanaians must understand that we don't make laws in hurriedly one week or two weeks or what. Now they have understood yes, what I Yes, now I've we've said. all come to understand that. So give and right. take all the processes. We know that 21 days maturity amongst others, with the whole process that you talk about all the way to ascent. When should we look at? What is the target? As a chairman of the committee, I'm sure you're looking at a timeline. What should we be looking at? This question, I mean, I have always say that it is difficult to answer and uh, like i said this week we have last week we were supposed to have met uh, some agencies on uh, our budgetary hearings mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't meet some of they came the reports were, no, were not ready earlier so we had to uh, actually agenda meeting to this week. Tomorrow we meet in early morning and the whole day we'll be meeting some of the agencies. They were supposed to meet some on Thursday and Friday, we couldn't. So that's why I said we are looking for a window of opportunity and then engage the Attorney General. And if we are very successful in meeting him for him to give us 
his opinion and explained things to us. We asked him questions, he answered. Then uh, our report will be ready. Yes, you've, you've told us that by close yeah. of before at the end of this meeting, you would have laid it. So I'm just saying that after it is done, you've, you've made it clear that it will be laid before you rise. This sounds, before this you rise. So 2022, uh, 2023, sounds, 2023, <laughs> 2024, because uh, the speaker. It sounds very positive that the, the report will be laid. Yes, we are far advanced on the bill. And I am positive if we have a window of opportunity, we could conclude this and file the report. So okay. all I'm saying is that it is conditioned on other things. That's what I'm drawing your attention. Okay. And I should not be misquoted that the bill is going to the report is going to be late tomorrow or the next. I can't be sure. But you mentioned that you will be late before you rise, before Christmas, right? Yes, I'm hoping. That's what I'm I'm hoping that we, and I told you what is left to be done. Okay. So if you are able to go through that, then nothing is left for us than to lay the report. Okay. And when the report is laid, that's when we do the second reading. And then we do the consideration. Okay. And then we do the third reading, then we are done. We are grateful uh, for your time. That's the Asante, right. Asante Achim Central MP. I, also, the chairman. You, you wanted to add something briefly? I don't want to believe that the interview was basically on LGBTQ. We and talked about censure. Things. We talked about yes, parliament <laughs> this time. We did. Okay. Thank you so much for keeping me in company tonight. On behalf of the entire team, we say many thanks for your company. Uh, we've been hosting the chairman of parliament's legal and constitutional affairs committee. I am MF Pao. There's more news when you log on to myjournalline.com. A walk with Jesus is up next for our radio audience. Have a good evening.